We're here in South Beirut. Behind me is a flashpoint neighborhood. There's been a lot of violence. This is about as far as you really want to go. Now, around us, what you can't see, the Lebanese army, they've asked us not to film them. We're respecting their request. Just after we refueled and shortly before we flew along the border, the commanders started debating safety. They decided because there's no communication with the American army, it's not safe to land at the border. So they brought us a few kilometers back from the border and we're going to drive in. Residents of Beirut today on Wednesday waking up to this absolute gridlock because of an economic protest that's taking part across the city. This landing zone at the 10th cache in Baghdad on any given day is literally buzzing with activity. It's supposed to be a lightning quick Black Hawk strike, but what it turned into was about a mile and a half to mile march. The entire time the Green Beret, U.S. Special Forces, let the Iraqis take the lead. They believe that they've led them to this suspected insurgent. You're the obvious choice to become prime minister. You've led the future movement for years. You've just won another majority in parliament. If the president asks you to form a government, will you accept the role of prime minister of Lebanon? Still here in the Hammer neighborhood, just about a quarter of a mile from where we were, this intersection serves as a perfect example of what's going on in Beirut. For starters, when things are good here, this is a bustling part of the city. Secondly, at the end of this corner here, there are gunmen with RPGs and machine guns. They've kind of taken cover behind that building. They've seen we're filming, but it gives you an idea. Just a quarter of a mile away, the Lebanese army on this street corner, gunmen. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah is expected to speak, and that is creating all kinds of concerns and fears of possible sectarian clashes. Our Cal Perry is on the line with us. Cal, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? Well, Tony, I'm in downtown Beirut, what's called Sotico Square. This is the former Green Line during the Civil War. You'll be able to hear the gunfire shortly, yeah. I'm sure. It's been absolutely raging. Now, as you mentioned, Nasrallah actually just completed his speech. We think we're seeing the result of that now. This all started about two days ago when the government declared Hezbollah's tel uh, telecommunications network illegal. Nasrallah came out and said that, in fact, he needed this to protect Lebanon, that it helped, quote, win the war against Israel. And what we're seeing now are street clashes, exceptional amount of gunfire. I'm actually with uh, Christian Strive, our cameraman here. We're pinned behind a building with the Lebanese army. They have not deployed in force yet, and we'll have to remain to see if that happens. Well, Cal, is this uh, firing between, uh, are these people firing in the direction of the military that's assembled, or is this, um, are we talking about clashes between neighborhoods? Right now, I think it's probably clashes between neighborhoods. I'm right on the edge of a Sunni neighborhood, and on literally the other side of the street is a Shia neighborhood. Now, the army is here sort of behind a building taking cover. They have not deployed yet. The Lebanese army has a very difficult job here in Beirut when these clashes are off. Sorry, Tony, you can hear an RPG explosion there. When these clashes kick off, the Lebanese army is charged with basically standing between the anti-government protesters and the pro-government protesters. You can imagine what a terrifying job that is. So they're, they're situated effectively right in the middle of these battling groups uh, from various neighborhoods. And, and, and what's the structure there? Have they set up uh, checkpoints to keep these... My goodness, you've got a scene going on behind you. Um, are we talking about checkpoints? that have been set up by the military to keep the neighborhoods separated? Well, exactly that. I mean, Beirut, as you may know, during the Civil War, there was a green line separating the two factions. That green line has remained with troops, uh, with APC carriers. And on any given day, you can see those APC carriers out on the corner. That's changed now. Since the, uh, the most recent crisis in the past two days, we've seen an incredible amount of Army presence on the streets. I'm looking at about 30 soldiers right now. And as I said, they're taking cover behind a building. Nobody wants to go fully out into this neighborhood. We've seen gunmen on the roof rooftops of this neighborhood. That's obviously terrifying for the army as a, a concern of snipers is something they're really worried about. I'm, I'm also curious as we continue to listen to the activity behind you as to the origins of this latest dust up. You, you mentioned, uh, I'm wondering, there was a strike, was there a strike over uh, minimum wages uh, recently that might have something to do with what we're seeing or, may, or maybe not? That's how it started. You're exactly right. About 48 hours ago, there was a planned strike by the biggest labor union here in Lebanon uh, over economic conditions and the minimum wage. You can quite frankly take that and just throw it right out the window, Tony, because what's happened is since then, Hezbollah and the anti-government coalition has used the strike as an excuse to come out onto the streets. In the meantime, 
The government here in Lebanon, as I said, declared this telecommunications uh, network illegal. Yes. And Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, came out and said, this is, quote, open war against us, and we're not going to stand for it. The fear here is that what we're seeing now is the result of that open war. And once again, and I'll let you go, Cal Perry uh, reporting from Lebanon for us. Cal, appreciate it. Find safety, my friend. Thank you. Absolutely. Years ago in Baghdad's combat hospital, and now their story. It was May the 4th of 2006 when we met Caleb Lufkin, here in Baghdad's busiest combat hospital. He was scared and near death. Don't you dare try to die on me, okay? I didn't get your permission. I won't let you die, dude. I promise. I give you, I give you, I promise. I give you my word, okay? It was a roadside bomb that shattered his body, and Caleb, like thousands of other wounded veterans, flew to Walter Reed Hospital for follow-on surgeries. Two years later, we wanted to hear for ourselves what had happened to Caleb after he left that hospital. So we came here to his hometown of Knoxville, Illinois, and visited with his mother. Marcy Gorsline immediately cast her mind back 20 years when her eldest son was just a kid. Took a little hand and you'd take him to the first day of kindergarten. They had the little backpack on, you know, and uh, you get him to the door where you don't want to let go of their hand. He grew up fast and seemed destined for a life of public service. He wanted to become a firefighter here in his hometown. But soon after he left high school. He called me up one day and he said, Mom, he said, I need my social security card. So why? And he said, well, Mom, I'm going to join the Army. And he did, graduating from basic training. He was suddenly a man. I mean, he, he went from being, I guess, my little boy. I, he was a man. Marcy was against the war in Iraq but she still had to let her boy go. And so he joined the 5th Engineering Battalion of the U.S. Army and was soon packing for his first deployment overseas. He had his backpack on and, and his fatigues, and uh, of course, I, we're all crying. And he looked over his shoulder before he got on the plane. He, I'll be all right, Mom. Breathe deep for me, Caleb. You having trouble breathing over there? A little bit. Big breath. Marcy flew immediately to his side, meeting him at Walter Reed Hospital and preparing for what was to be his final surgery before going home. He said, no, you're going to fly home with me, right? And I said, I said, you darn right I am. We're flying home. And uh, so he went into surgery. And right before he went in, I, I tussled his hair and, and I kissed him on the forehead. And I said, I love you, bud. And he said, I love you too, Mom. And then in an instant, Marcy faced every mother's worst nightmare. Caleb's heart had stopped, and he died on the operating table. We had to get on the plane without him. I felt like I let him down. You know, someone said, what's this war mean to you? Or what it, has it done? It took away dreams. It took away dreams. To the world, he was number 95 for Illinois. To us, he was the world. That's why he decided to hear? Uh-huh. He's where he's supposed to be. Under the flag. Under the flag. Knock on it. There we go. Every day, she comes to Knoxville Cemetery and tends to the grave of her eldest son. Her world is still turned upside down. Mom shouldn't have to bury her child. So now the flag's protecting him instead of him protecting the flag. But what's important to Marcy... I just don't want anybody to forget him. And I don't want anybody to forget the other 4,000. Cal Perry, CNN, Knoxville. Kids will be kids, even in a disaster zone. The water these kids are playing in is mere meters from a line of fresh, shallow graves that tell the story of a small village lost. Perhaps one of the most remote places in the world Close to Bangladesh's border with India, we travel by boat. Even from the water, it's obvious. The main city of Patrakata has been largely washed away. 400,000 people live in this city. The government says that 140 people died here. But the locals insist that well over 1,000 perished. Oh. And nobody knows how many have died in the outlying areas. Neither the government nor aid organizations have reached the more isolated places. We're the first to come here. 
the only way in is on motorbikes until the jungle becomes too thick. From there, we walk. The closer we get, the ominous stench of death becomes overwhelming. What we found was horrifying, even though we were warned. A decomposed body floats in a riverbed. The body so mangled after five days, the villagers can't tell us who it is. It's slowly pulled away from the body of an animal by a simple farming tool. Soon, it will be added to the line of graves. And as we get deeper into the jungle, where the farming village of Poda used to be, we encounter overwhelming grief. <laughs> Mujibar Param wails in agony while fellow villagers bury his six-year-old daughter, Lima. His story is gut-wrenching. <laughs> My daughter, wife, and I were clinging to a tree, he says. We were all holding hands, but a gust of wind came and swept my daughter from my arms. We are now helpless. There is no communication. Nobody has come here. Nobody has come. A simple farmer burying his six-year-old daughter in his own field, waiting for any help that simply has not arrived. Calperi, CNN, Poda, in southern Bangladesh.